All right, so we're going to go over conservation of mass in a little bit more depth. We do have some activities that we're going to do this week related to it. So let's get right into it. The law of conservation of mass states that matter can never be created or destroyed. So we've talked about this a little bit, but we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Okay, the mass of what goes into a chemical reaction, as we've talked about before, has to equal the mass of what's coming out. So the mass of what goes in must equal the mass of what's coming out. So if I gave you a problem on a quiz that looked like this, what do you think you should do with these numbers to find out, like when we react mag magnesium with oxygen, we get the compound magnesium oxide. What do you think we should do with those numbers to get the answer over here? Pretty straightforward. Add them. Add them. So that's all we have to do. So we're going to add them up because whatever goes in must equal whatever's coming out. So if we performed this reaction on an electronic balance and we had the magnesium and the oxygen separate and, um, and then we took their mass, and then we combine them to form the compound magnesium oxide, which would involve burning, by the way, um, then the mass of what comes out should equal that, okay? So we've got a six here, and then this is 10, carry the one, and that's gonna be 80.6 grams. So what goes in must come out. With a reaction like this, okay, you would not be weighing the oxygen ahead of time, obviously, because it would be oxygen in the air, right? So some kids might actually think that the magnesium, when it chemically reacted, it had gained weight. Um, when in actuality, if you could add up the amount of oxygen from the air that was combining with the magnesium as it burned, we would find that what went in was equal to what came out, okay? So a chemical equation, a chemical equation such as this down here is written to represent a chemical reaction. So this is a chemical equation and it's showing us what happens during a reaction. And just like your equations in math, like when you, and you don't have to write this, but like in math, when you're solving a really simple equation like this, I know Mr. Wardell tells you that part of an equation is you think about inequality and what goes on the left side must balance what comes out on the right. So you would know that the value of X in this case would be three, okay? So just like in math, when we, when we solve for X and we make sure that what's on the left equals what's on the right, we do the same thing with a chemical equation. So when a chemical equation is written to represent a chemical reaction, the chemicals on the left are known as, and we've talked about this vocabulary term before, the reactants. That's what's going to react. So that's a vocabulary term that we still have to know. And the chemicals on the right are known as the products. And I apologize, my arrow's kind of going over this, but it should say CaSO4. Okay, so these are our reactants and these are our products. So remember, during a chemical reaction, the types of atoms that go in have to be the same as the types that come out and the numbers of atoms that go in have to be the same as the number that come out. So what happens during a chemical reaction is what's attached to what is what changes, okay? So on the left, you can see that calcium is attached to chlorine. On the right, calcium is now attached to sulfur and oxygen. So there's a shuffling of what atoms are connected to what during that chemical change, okay? So this is showing you a little visual to show the reaction. So the calcium chloride was put into a test tube and it's a solution, which means it's a liquid. And the sodium sulfate or sodium sulfide, I'm not sure how, which one that is, it would be in this Erlenmeyer flask. They're both liquids. They say solution. You can see that the mass to start is 323 hundredths of a gram. And then we tip the whole system over and we mix the uh, calcium chloride with the sodium sulfate. 
and and then there's a reaction. And notice that um, we have a new substance that's being formed, and our indicator of a chemical change is a precipitate was formed. So this is one of the five signs of a chemical change. So we know when we mix those chemicals that we have to be looking for signs of a chemical change. Remember, light being given off, fizzing and foaming, changing color. This one has the formation of a precipitate. But one thing that you should notice from this diagram is that the mass going in and the mass coming out are equal. So the mass are equal. Now, one of the reasons that we put a lid on this is to trap any gases that might be formed. If a gas is formed and it escapes, it'll look like the law of conservation of mass was broken because it would weigh less if some of that gas escaped. Just like if you set a can of pop that's carbonated, that has carbon dioxide, you know when you set it out over time, it goes flat? That's because that gas is escaping into the air. So if you put that on a balance over time, it would look like the can of pop was losing mass over the course of several days. And that's simply because the gas is escaping into the air. So a lot of times when we run a chemical reaction, we want to have a closed system. So label that. An open system will almost look like if you have gases being produced, like there's a breaking of the law of conservation of mass. Okay, Preston. Um, you said mass can't be destroyed or created. How does acid work then? Acid is acting on like, let's say a metal or something like that. Remember when we did the vinegar and the little strip of magnesium? So you're not, you're just rearranging what's connected to what. So one of the things that happens is, is it looks like the magnesium was disappearing, but really it's just turning into a new substance. And so like with the acid eating away at that metal, one of the products that's being produced is hydrogen gas, which escapes, but you're just making a new substance. And so it doesn't look like a metal anymore because it's not, you know, by itself, it's combining with something else. And, and its properties are changing and it's looking different. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So now let's go on. The reaction, the reactants in this reaction include, so we were looking at this, the calcium chloride. Okay. That was a reactant and the sodium sulfate, Na2SO4. Okay. And the products then are what was on the right side of the chemical reaction. So we had calcium sulfate turning into a new substance. So what's connected to what changes, okay? And then NaCl. All right. So notice that the starting mass on the balance of the calcium chloride in the test tube and the sodium sulfate in the Erlenmeyer flask is 300.23 grams. When the test tube is inverted and the two chemicals mix, the products mass out at the same because we have a closed system and we're trapping any gases that might be made. And so what goes in must come out. What goes in must come out. So below is a physical change. Okay, so we're not talking about a, a chemical change. This is a physical change. So not, no change in the chemical makeup, just the appearance of salt dissolving in water. Look at the mass of the salt in the water before dissolving. We have 180 grams on the nose. So here's a pile of salt. Here's water. Look at the mass of the salt and water before dissolving. What would be the weight of the salt water mixture on the right? So now we take the salt and we put it in there and we're dissolving, which is physical. We should notice that the mass would be the same because matter is never created or destroyed. It's changing in its appearance and its properties um, and what's connected to what, but what goes in must come out. Remember, chemistry is science, not magic. Okay, am I going too fast? All right, so we'll move this up. So I guess we were supposed to circle one. When we dissolve this, the mass of what comes out would be equal to 180 grams. 
So sometimes matter can look like it has been destroyed, but it is not. Now, this is getting at what we were talking about with the open system and gases escaping. This has to do with gases that are formed during a chemical reaction and escape. Okay, it's important to run chemical reactions in what we call a closed system where you have everything kind of corked off and stoppered so that any gas that's produced doesn't escape. Okay, um, so let me reread this. It's important to run chemical reactions in a closed system where everything is sealed and all the products, including gases, are trapped. Okay, when reactions are run in an open system, the products of the chemical reactions like gases can escape and so it can look like it weighs less at the end. The other type of reaction that I want to point out, and I want you to write this down, let's say we took a piece of iron and we let it set out in a damp environment. Please write this down because this is another situation that I'll test you on. You'll have test questions. So that oxygen is coming from the air, okay? And so when this reacts with this, what's the problem? What's wrong? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Okay. So when the oxygen and the iron react together, you get the iron oxide, which is rust. Okay, so this is iron oxide. So if you were to take the mass of this, and obviously you're not massing the oxygen in the air. So like, let's say you, you take the mass of the iron and it's, you know, 10 grams, but then after it combines with oxygen in the air and now you take its mass, it's 15 grams, okay? It looks like it gained weight. But really, you have to understand that in this reaction, it's combining with oxygen from the air. So you're not, there's no way to kind of weigh that oxygen that it's reacting with, okay? Um, unless you run it in a closed system and you, you cork off the Erlenmeyer flask and you just use the oxygen that's present in the flask at the beginning. In that way, you should be able to see that it doesn't change, okay? All right, grab some notes, Lakin, right there off my desk. Okay, can I flip it, guys? Okay, so this is just showing you that if we have a reaction going, that gases can escape, and we would call this an open system. So this should be pretty straightforward. And in this Erlenmeyer flask, if you have gases being produced, We'll just say gases trapped, and this is a closed system, okay? And so this one is going to give us a more accurate representation of what's going on. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, it is. It's pretty straightforward. The tricky stuff comes when we try to balance chemical equations because it's problem-solving. And it's one of those things where I can help you to a certain extent, but it's like solving a crossword puzzle. When somebody helps you, they've solved it for you, right? So um, we'll talk about that, but it, it is a little bit more critical thinking. All right, so below is a chemical change of magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid. This is just like the question you asked me, um, Preston, because vinegar is acetic acid to produce hydrogen gas. What would be the weight of the products on the right after the chemical reaction ends? Okay, notice that this is an open system. And so hydrogen gas is being produced. And so what would you predict if you had this as a test question would be the mass of the products given the reactants are 180 would it be greater, less, or equal? What do you think, Carmen? It's an open system, and so the hydrogen gas that's being produced can escape. If it were equal, we'd have to have this trapped off. And so the products would be trapped. If it's an open system and they escape, the weight of what's produced at the end is going to be less than what we started with. Okay? All right.
So be careful on those. Okay. So now, if we know the mass of either the reactants or the products, we can determine an unknown mass because matter is never created or destroyed. Use the law of conservation of mass to fill out the missing information. So if we react hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and we get the product and everything fully reacts, then we get the product of water. The way to that, really, really simple, you guys, all you have to do is add your reactants together, okay? And that'll give you your product. So you would say 13.4 grams if everything reacted completely. If 100% of the hydrogen and 100% of the oxygen reacted, then what comes out would equal what went in. What do you think we should do to solve this next one? Anybody have any ideas? Brian, what do you think we should do? If we have methane reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water, what do you think we should start with in order to try and solve this? Well, what, what did I tell you to do on the left first when you're doing conservation of mass? Add them. So let's add them together, 12.2 and 14, okay? When we add those together, it's 26.2. Okay, that's what's on the left. So can anybody tell me how much carbon dioxide would be produced based on looking at that? What do you think, Maggie? Yeah, how'd you get that? Right, right. You subtracted 20 from 26.2 and that gave you 6.2 because what went in had to equal what came out, okay? And our next one is gonna be very sim similar, okay? This one, you have this compound being broken down to form these two elements. But again, what goes in must come out. So if I take my 23.6 and I subtract my 13, okay, I should get 10.6. So when you add these together, what's on the left is equal to what's on the right. Again, it's like a teeter-totter, and you're trying to get it to balance with people that have equal weights on both sides. Okay, so in understanding the law of conservation of mass, we can look at two different things, okay? You can run a chemical reaction on a balance and show that the mass of what goes in is equal to the mass of what comes out. The other thing you can do is you can count atoms and show that the number of atoms going in is equal to the number of atoms coming out. I don't know why I have those boxes there, but let's flip it, okay? So we're gonna do the second one right now, and you're gonna need a little bit of a refresher from stuff we did earlier in the year. So what we're gonna do is we're talking about balancing chemical equations by counting atoms, Okay, and this is the problem solving part of, of what we're talking about. So the number of atoms that goes in must equal the number that comes out. Below is a chemical equation to represent the chemical reaction that takes place between magnesium and oxygen when it burns, okay? So when you burn a ribbon of magnesium and it combines with oxygen in the air, it forms a new compound that looks totally different. This is telling us that two atoms of magnesium will react with one molecule, because there's no number here, of oxygen to make two molecules of magnesium oxide. So looking at this, okay, Drake, how many magnesium atoms are going in? Two. Two, okay. And then Drake, how many magnesium are coming out? Two. Two, good. And then how about Maggie, how many oxygens are going in? Two. Two. And then how many oxygens are coming out? Two. Now, some of you might have thought one because there's no number, but remember this big two means magnesium oxide two times, okay? So you got two magnesium coming out, two oxygen coming out. So that is a balanced equation, all right? So does the above reaction obey the law of conservation of mass? Yes, okay? So refresher if you're confused about counting atoms. This is a refresher. We've already learned this. So the subscript, remember sub means below, is the tiny number written at the lower right behind the chemical symbol. So this is a subscript right here, okay? Um, it tells the number of 
atoms per one molecule. Okay, so this is one molecule of calcium carbonate. Okay, every time we hit a new capital letter, we hit a new element. So, Jasper, how many calcium atoms do we have in this molecule? One, because there's no number after the calcium. And then Jasper, how many carbon? One. And then how many oxygen? Three. Okay. So what you need to recognize is in one molecule of calcium carbonate, and you don't need to know the name of it, we have one atom of calcium to one atom of carbon to three atoms of oxygen. How about the next one? Alexis, can you help us? How many hydrogen atoms in one molecule of water? Two. Okay, good. So we have one, or I'm sorry, for the hydrogen, we have two atoms. Okay, and then how many atoms of oxygen? One. one. So oxygen equals one atom. So this chemical formula is telling me in a molecule of water, I have two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Okay, Brian, can you help me with the next one? This is a molecule of sugar, one molecule. And in one molecule of sugar, how many carbon atoms do we have? 12, 12 carbon atoms. Then how many hydrogen? 22. 22. And then how many oxygen? 12. Good. All right, so we're just practicing a skill that we've already learned but we're gonna use that to help us balance chemical equations. So this says in calcium carbonate, that's this molecule up here, there is one atom of calcium, I'm just copying here, one atom of carbon and three atoms of oxygen. In water, we have two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. And in a molecule of sugar, there's 12 carbon to 22 hydrogen to 11 oxygen. So again, that's the first step is making sure you know how to count those atoms. Okay, now can we flip it? All right, so our last little page here. So these subscripts tell the ratio of atoms in a molecule and can never be changed. Do not ever, ever ever, ever, ever change a subscript. If you change the subscript, you change the chemical. So what this is telling you is when you're trying to balance a chemical equation, you can never change those little numbers because you change the chemical. So for example, let's say we're dealing with water. And I say, okay, I'm trying to balance this chemical equation that water is involved in. And I need two oxygens. So I'm just going to write my formula like this. That is not okay. You cannot do that. You cannot just add a two, that little subscript, because it changes the chemical. This is hydrogen peroxide. So you can never change those subscripts because if you do, you're changing what chemical you have. Now no longer do you have water, you have hydrogen peroxide, okay? So what we can change when we're balancing a chemical equation is the coefficient, okay? So we can change the coefficient. It's the large number in front of the chemical symbol, and it indicates the number of molecules. So the number that we can change is this big number. We can change the big number because it's simply telling us the number of molecules. So 4H2O means H2O, 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 H2O. It means that chemical four times, all right? This is sulfuric acid. This means three molecules of sulfuric acid. So H2SO4, three times, okay? So H2SO4, H2SO4. So we can have as many molecules as we want. So we can change that number. We just can't change our chemical by changing those subscripts. Okay.
So 4H2O means four molecules of water, okay? Blank total atoms of oxygen. So remember how we do this. We can either draw it out and count them, two, four, six, eight, or we can multiply the coefficient by the subscript. Four times two is eight hydrogen atoms. And then there's no number after oxygen, so that means one. So four times one is four total oxygen. Three H2SO4 means three molecules of sulfuric acid. But then if we want to know how many atoms total, Taylor, how many atoms total of hydrogen in three molecules of sulfuric acid? Six. six. Three times two is six. And then um, what do we think, Taylor, about sulfur? Three. three, because this is a one if there's no number, and three times one is three. Very good. And then what about your oxygen? Twelve. Twelve. Very good. Now we can choose to draw it out like this and count them. So hydrogen, two, four, six. But it's much easier to multiply your coefficient by your subscript. Okay, so now we're getting into what we're going to be doing for homework. I would leave that out, and I think you probably will be able to get your homework done by the end of the hour, okay? So let me pass it out and demonstrate, and then you don't have a lot to do. Dre. Can you go back to the lecture? I sure can. <laughs> yes. Do I have it in the right area for you? Yeah. Okay. Um, Bella, will you do me a favor and pass these out? Sure. Thanks. You know what I'm going to do? I mean, your fingers can actually work because your hands are the size of them. I want to do it real quickly because I'm still recording. <laughs> do is we're going to practice balancing chemical equations and I have lots of activities for you to do with this. Um, and the reason why we're doing it is we're proving the law of conservation of mass. This is giving an accurate representation of exactly what's going on when chemicals react. So the law of conservation of mass tells us that the total amount of matter is neither created nor destroyed in any physical or chemical change. Therefore, the mass stays the same before and after the reaction. Chemical equations demonstrate this principle because they are always balanced. The total mass of the reactants must equal the total mass of the products. You can check to see if any equation is balanced by counting up the number of atoms it has to be the same on each side of the equation. To balance an equation, you can adjust the big numbers, the coefficients, the number of molecules, until there are the same number of each type of atom on both sides. You are never allowed to change the smaller numbers, those subscripts, okay? So again, this is balance. This is showing us two nitrogens on the left, two nitrogens on the right, six fluorine, six fluorine, okay? So let's practice this together. So before we write anything in the boxes, let's see how many we have. So Ethan, how many hydrogen do we have on the left? Two. Two. So I'm going to put that up here. And then Ethan, how many oxygen? Two. Two. So I want everybody to write that up there like that. Now, how about Ethan, how many hydrogen do I have on the right? Two. Is hydrogen balanced on the left and the right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what about oxygen? How many oxygens? 
Is oxygen balanced? No. No, so there's a problem here. And a lot of times when I'm balancing equations, and there's no way to really kind of teach you this so that you can do it the same way every time, it's problem solving. What I do, though, is when I start to try and balance something, I look for a number that's odd, and I try to multiply it by 2 or some value to make it even. And that's how I always start. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, and again, you have to do this with a pencil because you're going to make mistakes and you'll have to erase. Okay. So now I've, I'm going to put a two here and see what happens. So um, Evelyn, how many hydrogens do I have on the right now? Two times two is four. four. And how many oxygens do I have? Two. Two. So I have two oxygens. So is this balanced? I got two hydrogen going in, four coming out, two oxygen going in, two oxygen. So now the oxygen's balanced, but the hydrogen's not. Can we do something over here to make the hydrogens going in equal to the hydrogens coming out? What do you think, Lake? And what can we do over here? Yeah, let's try a two. Let's put a two. So now let's see what happens. And you're going to write your final in here. So, Lakin, how many hydrogens are going in? Four. Four. And how many hydrogens are coming out? Four. Four. Okay. And then, Lakin, how many oxygens are going in? Two. Two. And how many oxygens are coming out? Two. Two. Two times one is two. This is balanced. So, this tells me that two molecules of hydrogen gas react with one molecule of oxygen gas to produce two molecules of water. This is a really simple equation. Let's try to do one more, okay? So phosphorus, we have four phosphorus on the left, two oxygen on the left, okay? On the right, we have two phosphorus, and we have three oxygen. So they're both a problem. They're both a problem. Okay? Remember how I told you I like to try and start with things that are odd and make them even and see what happens? See how this number's odd? What can I multiply to make it even? What can I multiply it by to make it even? What do you think, Carson? Two. Two. So let's do that and see what happens. Carson, how many phosphorus do I have on the right? Four, that balance is here, right? How many oxygen do I have? Uh, six. So what do you think I should multiply this by to make it equal? What do you think? Braden, what can I multiply this by to get six on the left? Three. Three. Does that balance now? I think it does. So we got four phosphorus going in. Two times two is four phosphorus coming out. Three times two is six oxygen going in. Two times three is six going out. So again, it might be a little frustrating sometimes, but you're just manipulating it. You gotta have a good eraser, okay? And so now I'm gonna have you guys for your homework do the right side. 